My name is Sarah, and this is my wilderness moment. I was living in a large Midwest city at the time, very isolated, and a very bad marriage that was turning deadly. My safe place was the back of my ambulance downtown. Ever since I had become an EMT, I had dreamed of becoming a paramedic, and after a very intense year of schooling, that was becoming a reality. Not only that, but my ultimate do not dare to dream of goal was within my reach, flight paramedic. I was good at my job and I loved what I did. And then just as everything was coming together, everything shattered. I lost what support I had from my in-laws. My family was 2,400 miles away. I lost the first two of my grandparents. I lost a patient on Christmas morning. A half a dozen family and close friends were diagnosed with cancer. I ended up enduring more betrayals than I thought a heart could ever handle. To top it all off, I had a back injury, and then a head injury, and then within months, a second head injury. And my career, my dreams, a huge piece of my identity was gone in an instant. My wilderness was more of a howling wasteland. I ended up fighting with suicidal thoughts day in, day out for almost a year and a half. My hope was gone and I felt like my entire life had burnt to the ground. I vividly remember one bitter, cold, stormy October night sitting in the grocery store parking lot, too exhausted and confused to do anything but breathe. And out of nowhere, there was a deep peace that made zero sense. Everything still hurt, circumstances hadn't changed, but I knew that everything was going to be okay, eventually. <laughs> and I was not alone. I never had been, and that I was so very loved. Hosea speaks of God speaking tenderly to us in the desert, and that was definitely the case for me. I couldn't hear him very well over the howling of my own pain, but he was so very close the whole time. I see it so clearly in retrospect. It's rather too dark to see it at the time. I just wanted so much to live, but I just didn't see how. In the end, it was, it was very simple, not easy, but simple. Psalm 118 verse 17 says, I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. I took a stand on that. I decided to live and simply kept putting one foot in front of the other. Even the tiniest effort was met and matched by his full support and power, and I would have just enough strength to do the next thing. In the end, the Lord himself did much of the work. He delights in making beauty from ashes. He just needed me to hand over my ashes and do my 5%. Seek him, seek help, accept help when offered, and not stop until I had the help I needed. And his strength covered the rest, gladly. And from my broken pieces, he indeed created something so beautiful and life-giving. Truly, he has redeemed the years of devastation. As you've been walking through these wilderness stories with me over the last several months, there have been several constants that showed up in every single one of the stories. A wilderness moment, Jesus' presence, and the chair that's been there every single week, which is good because I actually want to wrap up this series by talking about furniture. Some of you are like, what in the world is up with that? Just stick with me. My childhood bedroom was decorated with a combination of hockey stuff, animal posters, and that beautiful rust and brown motif of the 1970s. Anybody remember shag carpet? It was a beautiful thing, right? My college dorm was decorated with Christian music posters, handmade wooden shelves, and the very humble beginnings of a pastor's library. Laurel's in my first newlywed apartment was decorated with a, with a beautiful bedroom suite that was given to us as a wedding gift from her parents, a hand-me-down table from her brother and our sister-in-law, a wood cabinet TV. Do you remember those? Huge. And our very first purchased sofa and chair. Boy, we were living the life as newlyweds. Our home now is decorated beautifully by what I call Laurel style. It's comfortable and it's cozy. You just feel warm and welcome as soon as you walk in the door. Your furniture actually says a lot about you. 
And now, if you are suddenly considering redecorating, I have two words for you. Home goods. All right? That's as good as I got. God actually makes a portable home for himself in the wilderness. And how he decorated actually says a lot about him. God's portable home, a portable church in the wilderness was called the tabernacle. And God took multiple chapters out of the book of Exodus. In fact, if you look at the proportions, he spends an inordinate amount of time talking about his furniture and his style. That portable church had to move with the people of Israel. I want to remind you, they were nomads, and so they moved around. Every time they shifted, they packed up the church and moved it with them. Now, some of you are already wondering, what does Old Testament furniture have to do with me? Probably more than you know. Stick with me as we walk through this next little section. Let me show you a picture of the tabernacle so you actually have something in your head. It had an outer courtyard area that was surrounded by a curtain. And then inside of that were several pieces of furniture where the Levite priests would come and they would conduct the worship of God's people. There were seven major pieces of furniture and each one of them had a deep and symbolic meaning to the people of Israel. And they also had a deep and symbolic meaning to us. Here's what I need you to know as we walk through this. Every piece of furniture tells the story of Jesus. Every single piece. Let's walk through it together. When you entered through the exterior curtain of the tabernacle, the very first piece that you would see was the bronze altar. Here's a picture of it. When you see the bronze altar, I want you to think of the word sacrifice. Made of bronze, it was a place where animals were sacrificed. I know that makes some of us uncomfortable. Stick with me, it's going to get better. When you hear the word bronze in the tabernacle, I want you to think sin. When you hear the word gold, I want you to think God. But people would actually enter in through that outer curtain and they would bring sacrifices to the priest to be offered to God for the covering of their sin. Not the removal, but the covering of their sin. Blood was spilled there. It was not a pretty place because sin is not pretty. Has anyone else experienced that truth? Sin is not pretty. Now hold on to that word sacrifice because this is where we begin to see the story of Jesus unfold even in Old Testament furniture. 1 Corinthians 5 says this, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Jesus was our sacrifice on the cross. As you move past the brazen altar, you're going to move into what is known as an area where you see the bronze laver. When you see laver, I want you to think cleansing and forgiveness. The laver was actually a bronze bowl filled with water for ceremonial cleansing. The word laver is actually where we get our modern word lavatory from. It just means a place of washing. The priests would wash their hands. They would wash their feet. They would often wash, pour water over top of their heads because they wanted to come to God ceremonially clean. Now before we move any further, I want you to think about the order of this. If we had to be cleansed or forgiven first. If the labor was before the sacrifice, here's the message God would be sending us. You better clean up your act before you come. You better take a shower before you have a bath. You, you better get your act together and then you can have access. That's not the order. The order is actually flipped. We're covered by the lifeblood of the sacrifice and then through that cleansing we are made clean. God forgives through Jesus and then we're empowered to live clean. Here's an interesting note. The bottom of the laver was polished like a mirror. So every single time the priest would go to wash their hands, they had to take a long look in the mirror. I think we should all take a long look in the mirror. Years ago, our family uh, built a house and I would show up on the job site to clean up after the workers because that was about all I could contribute to the project. Just not very mechanically inclined. I rolled up one morning and I noticed that all of the construction guys were smiling at me. Like really big smiles. Like uncomfortable and awkward, why are you looking at me that way kind of smiles. And when I got into my car to leave, I figured out why all of these tough construction guys were just grinning at me from ear to ear. When I got up that morning, it was winter, my skin felt a little dry and itchy, so I grabbed some of my wife's lotion, took a generous amount, and smeared it all over my face. And it was only in the sunlight that the shimmery, glittery aspects of that lotion were fully revealed for everyone to see. I should have taken a long look in the mirror before I showed up on the construction site because when I stepped into the sun, the glitter was revealed, and I can say one thing that morning, I was sparkling. 
I mean, I was sparkling and I was embarrassed. I should have just paused and looked. When we pause and take a long look in the mirror, we see our own brokenness. But I hope we see more than that. I hope we see the hope of Jesus. 1 John 1, 9. Think about the labor and the washing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I got a little homework for you this week. When you wash your hands, and we're still supposed to be doing that a lot, when you do that, if there's a mirror nearby, take a look. Take a look, but don't focus on how broken you are. Focus on how whole Jesus is. We're not going to move from the outer courtyard into that tent that was towards the back of the tabernacle. The first portion of the tent was actually called the holy place. And when you walk through the curtain and and you actually pushed it back, it would be completely dark except for a seven-wicked golden lampstand that was the only source of light. And I want you to hold on to that word light. It's also known as a menorah. And the golden lampstand had an interesting factor to it. There were bowls filled with oil that were filled 24-7 so the light would never ever go out. Not once. It was made of gold. Remember that. Bronze means sin. Gold means God. We're actually moving closer to the presence of God. And in order to be able to really see and experience God, we're going to need light. Isn't it interesting that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never Never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In the same area of the tent, what was known as the holy place, we find something called the table of showbread. When you hear the word showbread, I want you to think about God's provision. It was a golden table. Here's a picture of it. And the table held 12 loaves of unleavened bread that were left there for an entire week at a time. And then on the Sabbath, the priests would come and they would actually consume all of the bread. Of course, the 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And some of you are thinking, you're going to choke down weak old bread that's been sitting on a table in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the wilderness. Don't worry. Okay. God actually had us covered. Unleavened bread is already dry. It's not an issue. When you think of that table and you think of God's provision, I want you to think of God inviting his people to his table to connect and to be fed. Isn't it interesting that Jesus would say, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If a man eats of this bread, he will live forever. So we have the golden lamp stand, we have the table of showbread, and then we move towards this large curtain, and before we get there, we encounter something called the altar of incense. We had the brazen altar for sacrifice, now we see the altar of incense, and I want you to think of the word prayer when you see that. Every morning and evening, the, the priests would go and they would light incense, and that sweet fragrance would fill the tent, and it would rise to God just like our prayers do, morning and evening. Whenever I think of of prayer and I think of that conversation between God and ourselves, I think of this beautiful verse from Revelation. It says, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Just so we know who the Lamb of God is, our perfect sacrifice, it's Jesus. And it says, Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So in the holy place, in the front section of this tent, we find prayer, we find provision, and we find light. Isn't that what the church is supposed to be? A place of prayer and provision and light. But here's the problem. We're there with the table, we're there with the lampstand, we're there with the altar of incense. But along the the wall now, intersecting in the middle of the tent, is this huge, humongous curtain. Our access is blocked, but I want you to hold on to that word access. This is actually a cutaway picture so that you can see it. So the priest would come in into that first section. You can see the the golden lampstand. You can see the table of showbread up on the top there. You can see the altar of incense. And then there's a cutaway there of that curtain. That curtain would go all the way across, blocking the entrance. You, You couldn't get by, except for if you were a priest who entered one day a year on what was known as the Day of Atonement. Here was an interesting part about that, that priest's job description. They would be selected from among a group of Levites. They would be assigned, you're going to go in to the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. You're going to go back behind the curtain. And here's the deal. If you go in and something's not right between you and God, 
You're dead. So before you go, here's what we're going to do. We're going to tie a little bell on the bottom of your rope. We're going to tie a rope to your ankle because if you walk in and everything's not cool between you and God and you die, we need some way to retrieve your body. Who would want to sign up for that job, right? Oh, yeah, let me do that one. The curtain was a barrier. It was a barrier between God and people. God is holy. We are not. God is perfect. We are imperfect. We are sinners. And sinners need saviors. Do you know what we need? We need someone to tear that curtain down. We need someone to shred it from top to bottom. Some of you know exactly where this is going because Easter is coming and you've already heard this story. Hang on for just a second. It's going to get really, really, really good. The Bible says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. It's coming, and some of you are already anticipating this, so I'll, I'll give you a clue as to what's going to happen. We need someone to tear that curtain down to give us access to the holy of holies, and Jesus is going to do exactly, exactly that. But before that happens, let's find out what's on the other side of that curtain. On the other side of the curtain was what was known as the Ark of the Covenant. Here's another picture so you can visualize it in your head. And when you see the Ark of the Covenant, I want you to think of the word mercy. The ark was a wooden box covered in gold and inside of it were the Ten Commandments, God's standard for people. There was a golden pot of manna to remind God's people of God's provision in the wilderness. And Aaron's rod was in there. Aaron's rod was a dead stick that came to life, sprang to life in a miracle that we didn't get to cover on our journey through the book of Exodus. Sorry, we just ran out of time. The cover of the ark which represented the presence of God, had two angels. And covering the center of the ark was the most important piece of furniture in the entire tabernacle. It was known as the mercy seat. When the priest would come in on the day of atonement, he would sprinkle blood over the mercy seat and God would make a decision. A decision to choose mercy instead of judgment. The mercy seat is where you and I get what we don't deserve. God's grace. The Bible says, but because of his great love for us, God who's rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Transgressions, fancy word for the worst of us. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Here's an interesting note. In Old Testament times, if you touched the ark even by accident, you were dead. Here's the cool truth, truth now. God has invited us to get up close with his presence. And when we move close, we don't die, we live. Seven pieces of furniture and they all tell a story of Jesus. God's design is so powerful. Even the furniture has details of the story of Jesus. Chip and Joanna have nothing on God when it comes to furniture and how he designs. This is incredible, impeccable style. And stick with me, it gets better because all of this means this. In our wilderness moments, when we feel stuck in the in-between, when, when we are not fully out of where we've come from but not fully crossed over into where we want to go, when we've left Egypt but we're still stuck in that in-between land and not quite in the promised land, when we find ourselves stuck in that liminal transitional space, this furniture actually points us towards the most beautiful story you have ever heard. Some of you are asking the question, rightly, so what, Grant? Like, so what? Seven pieces of furniture from centuries ago. What does this have anything to do with me right now? Well, let me make this as practical and personal as I possibly can. Here's the answer to your so what. If you're a follower of Jesus today, Jesus is our tabernacle. 
He's God's presence with us. And isn't it amazing in our mobile society that God goes with us every single step that we take. Jesus is our tabernacle. John 1.14 says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling. That's an important word. You should circle it. Made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Jesus actually made his dwelling amongst us. And this is where the Old Testament nerd in me just comes out because I love this kind of detail. The word dwelling and the Greek word for tent as in tent of meeting. Do you remember that from last week where Moses met with God face to face and they talked like best friends? They're the same as the Hebrew word for this tent in Exodus 33 verse 7, which literally means this. Jesus tabernacled amongst all of us. Jesus is God's presence. Jesus is the holy of holies, which means this. Jesus is the access to God's presence. Some of you don't look convinced yet. I'm going to I'm have to amp it up just a little bit. And it's not coffee. It's the power of God's word when it actually settles into your soul. I'm studying the tabernacle. I'm looking at all of the different elements. And here's the one truth that just that absolutely wrecked me. There's a door. God could have built an impenetrable barrier between you and his presence. He didn't. He built a door. And the door is open. And you can walk through it. Not on your strength and on your power, but on the strength and power of Jesus. Listen to scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. Those of you who are familiar with the Easter story, this amazing thing happens when God actually dies on a cross, when he gives up his spirit, something happened in the temple in Jerusalem. The temple is just a permanent tabernacle. So they made it permanent in Jerusalem. And when Jesus died, the historical record says the most interesting phenomenon happened inside of the temple. The curtain that was still there was ripped, shredded from the top to the bottom. And that's what this means. Let me tell you what it means. It means God kicked a door open and said, no longer will anything be a barrier between you and God. Instead, you can walk through and have direct, direct access. Jesus said this, I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus holds the door open and says, would you like to come in? Would you like to be known by God? All you have to do is accept the sacrifice. Jesus will cleanse you. He is the light of the world. He is your provision. This you will do in remembrance of him. You can pray directly to him, push through the curtain because it's been shredded from top to bottom and walk right into the holy of holies where God will meet you with mercy. Wow. Wow. And here's the crazy thing. It gets better. It gets better. Jesus is our access to God's presence, but Jesus is also our great high priest. We don't need a human priest. You don't need a pastor to talk to God. My friend Russell says, get your eyes off the pastor and onto the master. I mean, that's the way that it's supposed to be. I could show up and pray for you. That would be awesome. I would love the opportunity to do that, but you can talk directly to God. You don't need me to show up or any one of our other pastors, Pastor Derek or Pastor Brian or Pastor Wendy. You don't need us to show up and sprinkle clergy dust on top of you to make something spiritual happen. You can talk directly to God because you have a great high priest. His name is Jesus. Jesus hears our confession. Jesus forgives our sin. Jesus grants mercy. I can't absolve anybody from anything. Aren't you glad you have a great high priest who can? Listen to Hebrews chapter 10. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Would anybody else in the room love to just have your conscience wiped clean? 
Like just all of the worst of you just suddenly gone. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression, the worst of us, from us. This is a call to draw near. Because our high priest is Jesus. We can talk to Jesus. We have a high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. That's what Molly read earlier in the service when she used the power of Scripture to reach or to pray over top of each and every one of you. We have a high priest who hears our prayers. We have a high priest who's opened a door and is holding the door open. We have a high priest who's blessed us, every single person in this room, to become a priest as a part of the priesthood of all believers. Some people just say, like, you know, I want to come and hear the minister talk. You're not looking at the minister, I'm looking at the ministers. You are the priesthood of all believers. You no no longer need a human priest because you're actually our priest. You've been given access to God. You've been given the power to bless and anoint and pray and give away the very grace that God has given you. And if you need some kind of spiritual deputization, there you go. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live up to your identity. Go and be priest. For the love of God, Whatcom County needs us. They need us. And it gets better. Because we have such a great high priest, Jesus is the full and final sacrifice. Some of you are offended at the idea of an animal having to give its life to cover the sins of people. I understand. I love animals too. You should love Jesus even more then. Because when Jesus became the full and final sacrifice, it meant no more animal sacrifice, no more blood, no more substitutions, no more ritual, no more anything. You know why? Because Jesus said, it is finished. Finished. Once and for all, no more sacrifices needed because the perfect spotless lamb, the lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, gave his life on a cross. We never have to go back to it ever again. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. If you're taking notes, underline these next three words. Once for all. Never again. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. Here's the beauty of Scripture for me. The Old Testament priests would do the same thing day after day, night after night, ritual after ritual, sacrifice after sacrifice, blood after blood. It was the same thing over and over and over again. You know why? Because that sacrifice could only cover sin. Jesus didn't just cover it. He removed it from your record. That's good news, 1115. We should be excited about that. Washed away. Here's my question. If God washed away the worst of you, why do you keep going back to it? Don't lose the lessons. But that is not who you were. If you know Jesus, you're not broken, you're beautiful. You're not wrecked, you are righteous. And we are living to that identity each and every day. And we don't need to depend on ritual that goes on and on and on and on and on that simply covered sin. We have a great high priest who made a final sacrifice. Our sin is gone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And then it says, but when this priest, meaning Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. What's the big deal about the fact that the priest sat down? It's because if you look at the Old Testament model, here's what happened. It was the same repetition over and over and over again. Sacrifice, repeat, sacrifice, repeat, sacrifice, repeat, over and over and over again. Do you know why Jesus actually sat down? It's because when he made his full and final sacrifice, there was nothing else to stand up for. It was finished. He was done. And the Bible says, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those 
who are being made holy. Jesus was our full and final sacrifice, and now he waits. He waits for the day when cancer dies, pain is gone, abuse disappears, hunger is eradicated, war is over, violence is a, is a distant memory, racism is crushed. My friends, I have incredibly good news for you. If you are a follower of Jesus, one day all of that evil will become his footstool. It will be under his feet. He will crush it and it's never coming back again. That's good news. And Jesus will rule and reign Forever. Okay, some of you are visual, so I need you to actually walk in your imagination with me. You open up the outer courtyard and you walk in with the sacrifice and Jesus takes it and he says, I've got this. He becomes your full and final sacrifice, so he walks you to a bronze laver where you can take a long look in the mirror and, and you could get discouraged, but Jesus reminds you, you are my son. You are my daughter. It's not your identity that needs to be fulfilled anymore. It's my identity in you that will give you strength. Why don't you come with me? We have a special place to go. And then he walks you into the tent and you see a golden lampstand and, and the light is flickering and you think in your mind, I'm so glad that there's a source of light in here, otherwise it would be so unbelievably dark. And then you walk over to the table of showbread and Jesus actually takes the piece of bread and he breaks it and he hands it to you and he whispers, do this in remembrance of me. And then he welcomes you to the altar of incense and he says, let's have a conversation. Let's talk. Tell me about your heart. Tell me about your week. Tell me the things that you need from me. I'm here. My presence is never going away. And as that conversation continues, you look down on the ground and you realize that there's two parts of a curtain laying on the dust. And there's no obstacle. There's no barrier. And Jesus takes you by the hand and he walks you up to the Ark of the Covenant and you kneel in front of the mercy seat and he puts his hand on the top of your head and says, I know this wilderness has been hard for you. But have mercy. Receive mercy. Whew. Isn't Old Testament furniture incredible? It's an amazing story. That was for those that are visual, for those of you that are still verbal. <laughs> our sin separates us from God. Jesus became our perfect sacrifice once and for all so we could be cleansed. Though our sins be as scarlet, he's washed us as white as snow. Guided by the light of the world, we can commune with God at his table and we are welcome to eat of the bread of life. Our, our prayers rise to God's heart and God's ears. And in the holiest of places where God meets man because of Jesus, we receive mercy, we access the presence of God, and we never have to leave. Ever. We've done just a, a cursory overview of the book of Exodus. There's so much more. We could spend years in this book. When I think back to why we even wanted to, to start with this series, it was because we felt like the book of Exodus represented us and our culture right now. We're still in that in-between place, aren't we? I mean, we, we've, we've left certain parts of, of life behind. We're in that in-between space, space. We're not quite where we want to be quite yet. We've left Egypt, but we're not in the promised land. We've, we've left an old life behind, but we're not quite yet in heaven. We're in that liminal in-between space, and we just thought together as a team, if we could walk people in the wilderness for a little while, how encouraging it would be if we found out that in the wilderness we actually have company. If you've taken nothing else out of the last eight weeks, I hope and pray it would be this. When you are in the depth of your wilderness, God is there. He takes up residence. He doesn't pull away, sit in heaven and make arbitrary decisions about your life. No, he actually steps towards you in the wilderness of despair. 
And as we are all there, we are challenged to look around realizing that every detail, every story, ancient and current, points us towards Jesus. Every detail points us towards Jesus. Even the furniture points us towards Jesus, which begs the question, do you know Jesus? Have you asked God to take up residence, to tabernacle in your heart and your soul? Have you had a moment where you surrendered in your wilderness and asked God to walk you every dusty step towards the promised land? My prayer is that if you have not, that today is the day you do. I think we all have the wilderness in common, and wouldn't it be amazing if we all had Jesus in common too? In every single service this weekend, we've had people give their lives, hearts, and futures to Jesus because they finally saw that Jesus took their place as the full and final sacrifice. My hope and prayer is right now, if, if you'd like to begin a relationship with the God of the wilderness and the God of the promised land, that you will courageously give your life to him today. He will never leave your side. In a moment, we're going to pray. I'm actually going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes simply so you can concentrate. That's all that is. So I'm going to invite those people in the room. If you'd pray with me, if you could bow your head, close your eyes. Those of you that are at home, in a, in a living room, in a bedroom, in a car, in a coffee shop somewhere, would you do the same? As we push the distractions away today. So much wilderness. My prayer is that if you have never invited God into that moment, the dry and dusty wasteland, that today would be the day, and I believe you can invite him by praying this simple prayer, Jesus, I don't understand all of this, but I've heard you gave your life to remove everything that I regret. So God, I confess that to you. God, I confess everything that I've ever done wrong that broke your heart. And I ask that you'd forgive me. God, I pray that you would cleanse me right now. God, I, I'm, I'm seeing the light of who you are. And I thank you for providing for me even when I didn't deserve it. God, I thank you for hearing my prayer right now. So God, as I, as I kneel in front of your presence, I simply pray, have mercy. Have mercy on me, a sinner, and I thank you. You said you would. I ask you now to be my Lord and Savior. I give my life to you fully and completely. God, I, I want to serve you. I want to share with other people my story and how you, how you saved me. So God, I give my life to you and ask that you would tabernacle in me, that you would take up residence in me, and that you would use the rest of my life to bring honor to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, regardless of location, if you prayed that prayer sincerely, my Bible says you just became a new creation. And I'd love to pray with, with you and for you this week. I would never do anything to embarrass you, but if you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up in the air right now? Just lift it straight up so that I can see it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. 
If you're at home, I can't see your hand, but Jesus can. Thank you for making the most important decision of your life. God, for all those who've turned towards you today, I thank you that you meet them at the mercy seat. I thank you that even your furniture tells the story of Jesus. I pray that they would be forgiven and set free today. That they would walk in the way of Jesus through the wilderness all the way home to eternity with you. I thank you for all that you are doing in Jesus' name.